Welcome everyone to Girl Trouble, Breaking Through the Bias in AI, hosted by UNESCO in cooperation with the World Economic Forum on the occasion of International Women's Day, one of my favorite days. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Natasha Gutierrez. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Vice in Asia Pacific and your moderator for today's important conversation. Today, we will discuss women's leadership in artificial intelligence as a sector and a technology. Our speakers and panelists today are female changemakers in AI. From C-suite professionals taking decisions which affect us all, to women innovating new AI tools and policies to help vulnerable groups, to those courageously exposing injustice and algorithmic biases, they are challenging inequality to help forge an inclusive world. Over the next two and a half hours, and I promise it will fly by, we will hear about why including women in AI design, development, and deployment is necessary so we can successfully mitigate the challenges of gender bias and opportunities for AI to address barriers to women's advancement in society globally. There will be two panels, one dedicated to the female training and recruitment crisis in AI, and the second dedicated to innovative AI-based solutions to address bias against women. Each panel will be followed by a Q&A session, question and answer with participating media. And we encourage all of you following on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter to post your questions in the comment section that we will be closely following. We also encourage everyone to share your thoughts on social media using the hashtags UNESCO, hashtag World Economic Forum, hashtag IWD 2021, and hashtag AI. I recognize that World Economic Forum is quite long and tweets are only 140 characters, so you can also use hashtag uh, WEF. But first, let's hear from Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General of Social and Human Sciences, leading the development of UNESCO's recommendation on the ethics of AI, the first global standard setting instrument in this field. Gabriela, the floor and screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha, and welcome you all. Welcome to UNESCO main event on the International Women's Day. I want to thank our partner, the World Economic Forum, but I want to thank all the speakers because we brought the best and the brightest to help us untangle the question of gender parity in the, in the artificial intelligence world. And I, I also want to thank uh, our dear Sasha Rubel and Claire O'Hagan and their teams for this very hard work. At UNESCO, let me, let me a little bit of showing off. At UNESCO, female, female leadership is a reality. We have a woman director general. We have three or five assistant director general that are women. And women outnumber men in the UNESCO staff. Sadly, we all know that this is not what the real world looks like. And this is not what the artificial intelligence as a sector looks like either. The World Economic Forum estimated three years ago that only 22% of AI professionals globally are women. There are questions of whether these numbers are increasing or decreasing, but the fact is it's very, very low. With persisting gaps in female representation in the workforce, in pay, in training, and skill sets, we risk leaving more than half of humanity behind in the development of technologies and in advancing this very important uh, sector. How do we address this? To build an artificial intelligence ecosystem which represents our diverse societies, we must ensure diversity and inclusion that, and, and build these two elements in, in all the A life cycle from design to development to deployment. UNESCO is working to deliver, as Natasha mentioned, the first global normative framework in the field of artificial intelligence. And I'm very proud to tell you that we have a very strong gender chapter, not only with the problems and the challenges, but very concrete recommendations. Our recent consultation with experts around the world gave us detailed picture of how AI impacts women negatively and held into the draft our recommendation on, on ethics of AI. And now we're building a strong support of, among our member states for this recommendation. And in the future, we, hope and we are sure that it will become the template for regulating AI, including on gender issues. This recommendation will ensure targeted financing for projects on women in AI, 
It will ensure more girls in STEM and ITC, and actually related to mathematics and all the sciences that are behind the development of AI. And it will also represent more investment in women skills and will ensure affirmative action and quotas in the business world that we know work. Even if it makes somebody uncomfortable and some people uncomfortable, they work because we need more representation at the top. The recommendation will also help governments overcome the gender built-in bias found around AI devices, data sets, and algorithms by ensuring inclusive artificial intelligence development teams and by insisting on the use of representative training data and the formal assessment of how AI disadvantage, disadvantage women. According to a report that I uh, coordinated in 2019 on gender digital divides, 85% of the software developments are performed by male-only teams. And then we wonder why we have these biases getting their way through the digital world. And so we are confident that this recommendation will really become a moral compass, an ethical compass on the AI revolution on their way, ensuring the participation of women and girls, not only as a consumer, not only as an active users, but shaping, shaping the digital world. Our two panels today, as uh, Natasha mentioned, will be covering very important elements of this puzzle. The first will examine why women are not helping to build the new technologies reshaping our world. Why we're not represented at the highest level in tech? And perhaps more importantly, why we are not doing the coding? Only 6% of software developments worldwide are women. There is a female AI recruitment crisis. All major tech companies report challenges to diversifying their workforces. And the gender skills gap is very real. Why don't girls aspire to work in tech, the fastest growing sector in the world and actually fascinating sector? The number of girls who say that they went a career in engineering on computer science is very low. Women jobs are all far greater risk than men of being replaced by artificial intelligence. UNESCO owned data predicts women will lose five jobs for every one gained through the digital revolution compared to the loss of three by men. It's not only employment inequality that is worrying, it's also that women academic research in AI, their thought leadership, hold less influence than men. Last month, UNESCO warned that women work is underrepresented in high profile journals, scientific journals, and they receive the smaller research grants than their male colleagues. So you see, there is just an accumulation of disadvantages and obstacles that are be developing in this very important AI world. In business, their ideas are undervalued too. They're 13 times less to file for a technology patent. The second panel will address the problem of gender bias in AI. AI is trained on data which does not represent past constituencies of humanity and women being the biggest group. The facial recognition technologies on which the world will soon be dependent cannot even see women or black people. And that's why many people are saying, just, let's just ban facial recognition. AI at the current rate will reverse our hard won gains for gender equality. But we have a window of opportunity to exchange change. And the time is now. This panel is a call to action to include women in AI, and we'll be listening for very concrete proposals and how to do it. We have the data, we have the diagnosis, we need to act now. What collective action can we take across genders, countries, and disciplines to ensure women are the driving force of the fourth industrial revolution? I think there are many things that we need to do, starting for eliminating stereotyping, going from affirmative action, and really pushing a gender lens agenda in the AI world. I'm looking forward to this discussion. UNESCO is leading the charge in so many ways in this agenda, and I'm so glad to be welcoming you to this very important event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabriella, for your inspiring remarks. I think there is so much importance in, like you mentioned, eliminating stereotyping and pushing a gender lens, especially in, in advancing uh, AI. You know, uh, we want to also 
highlight that this shows the data shows the urgency of rectifying ongoing bias in AI as technology, but also as a sector. Thank you, Gabriella. For now, I'd like to pass the floor to our keynote speaker, Kay Firth Butterfield as head of AI and machine learning and a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum, Kay develops new alliances to promote awareness of gender bias in AI. Kay embodies women in leadership in this field. In fact, just days ago on Friday, the New York Times published an article on 10 women changing the landscape of leadership. Kay was recognized as a leader in the field of AI, ensuring that the technology is harnessed to benefit humans. And I'm sure you're all excited, as am I to hear what she has to say. Kay, the screen is yours. Thank you. Well, it's obviously so difficult to follow Gabriella, whose words are um, just so inspiring, but it's also a huge pleasure for me to be invited to give this keynote, which I give on behalf of women everywhere. Today marks not only International Women's Day, but also the significant partnership between UNESCO and the World Economic Forum to collaborate on building firm foundations for artificial intelligence, onto which we can build beneficial AI for all, no matter who you are or where you live. We need to work together and we're delighted to have UNESCO's Director General on the steering committee for the forum's newly launched Global AI Action Alliance, along with other wonderful women, such as the head of Imperial College, the Executive Director of UNICEF, UNICEF, UNICEF and the General Secretary of the ITUC. All women who prove to us that the glass ceiling really can be shattered and there is a pathway forward for us. Our Global AI Alliance is a multi-stakeholder collaborative platform and project accelerator to speed the adoption of inclusive, trustworthy and transparent AI globally and across all sectors and needs. So beyond the obvious, why do we need women in AI? Start, and so I start with some of those alarming statistics that Gabriella mentioned. First of all, the forums noting that only 22% of women who create algorithms are women. And those figures are even smaller for minorities. Just 7% of ICT patents in the G20 countries are obtained by women. And a, truly alarmingly, only 10% of technology startup companies that are seeking VC funding were founded by women. You know, frankly, this is tragic because we know that algorithms become filled with bias from the historical data that they use and the people who code them. Thus, as women, we're doubly disadvantaged. And as ever before, there's not only a disadvantage to us as women, it disadvantages our families, our communities, and the companies that don't hire diverse teams, which research shows are actually better for business. So what can we do? I want this to be a bit of a call to action. First, I think that we should go on and create those diverse teams in AI anyway even if at the moment that we haven't got enough women as AI scientists, it takes a diverse and multi-skilled team to create robust and responsible AI products. And so if we bring in women in this way, at least our voices are heard in the design and development phases to reduce the bias and other problems that we see in AI so wonderfully enumerated by Gabriella. Secondly, I think we should seek out and include organizations which represent women and minorities in AI. For example, our partners, AI and you, and Equal AI. Thirdly, as women, we should be joining the work of UNESCO that Gabriella just mentioned, and also of the World Economic Forum on this topic. Fourthly, 
At the forum, I'm working with VCs to lift up that appalling figure of 10% of women founders in ICT. I'm delighted that we have partners like Defined Crowd, whose female CEO and founder has been breaking those VC boundaries in the last year. Fifthly, we need to encourage our daughters to take up a career in tech. Young women need role models, and we must be such loudly and actively. I'm proud to say that my daughter, as a pilot in the US Air Force, now has a woman as one of the top three commanders. I could go on, but sadly, my time is short. So finally, I ask that all of you who are in ICT and particularly AI, we make a noise. We let girls around the world know that you exist. We give interviews. And most of all, we become mentors. Women in AI and women in AI ethics both have mentorship programs. I encourage anyone listening to become a mentor or a mentee. And remember, too, there are others fighting for a seat at the table. Let's make sure we extend a hand because together we can make the world a better place with beneficial AI. Thank you. Thank you, Kay, for that inspiring keynote and for highlighting the need to work together, especially in bringing not just women into AI, but particularly minorities, but also emphasizing that there is a pathway for us women in AI. And thank you for underlining the importance of mentorship. I think that's always very important. I appreciate your remarks. Now, it's my pleasure to invite the following panelists to the screen for our first panel. Uh, while I wait for them to join us, let me, tell you every, let me tell everyone who's watching what this first panel is about. The first panel is dedicated to the female training and recruitment crisis in AI. And the fact is, although we've already heard so many uh, facts and numbers earlier, women's voices are not feeding into the blueprint for our future. According to the World Economic Forum data, only 22% of AI professionals globally are women. Companies hiring experts for AI and data science jobs estimate fewer than 1% of the applications they receive come from women. And women and girls are four times less likely to know how to program computers and 13 times less likely to file for technology patents. They're also less likely to occupy leadership positions in tech companies. In February this year, UNESCO's publication, To Be Smart, The Digital Revolution Will Need to Be Inclusive, warned women are at risk of being left behind in the race for jobs in AI. This panel will look at what we can do to attract more women to jobs in AI, women's leadership in the AI field, innovative solutions to ensure AI literacy for women and girls, and policies and programs that ensure women have a seat at the decision-making table throughout the entire AI life cycle. And now we will hear directly from the women leading this change in the public and private sector. With us are Ashwini Asokan, CEO and co-founder of Mad Street Den. Please join me, speakers. And Bialak from the Women in Africa Initiative. Latifa Mohammed Al Abdul Karim, Assistant Professor, College of Computer and Information Science, King Saud University, and member of the Shura Council in Saudi Arabia and Nanjira Sambuli, member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel for Digital Cooperation and advisor for the a Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms. Such a mouthful, but just amazing woman joining us in today's conversation. Let's get started. I'll dive, I'll dive right in. And uh, Shwini. Hello. A great article. Hello. Hello. A great article was published about you recently by the Financial Times, highlighting how you have put diversity at the heart of Mad Street, C, uh, Mad Street Den as CEO and committed to a 50-50 gender policy in your company. Sounds tough, but can you tell us more about this policy and the challenges that you have faced in implementing it, especially after we've learned all of this numbers and data about the inequality? And what can be learned from your experience? Um, I've spent over 15 years thinking about this and have been very fortunate to have some incredible role models um, 
over these years uh, across my time at Intel in the US and and um, many other times of many other kinds of role models. And I say role models <clears throat> in particular because um, I'm going to start off with you know one of the key things that we did um, when we started the company. Um, we kind of enforced a top down as well as a bottoms up um, approach to bringing diversity into the company. Um, the top down part of it, I mean, I, I literally started talking about role models because precisely because of that, right? Um, like the keynote speakers and 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 the folks that just um, you know spoke about the different types of numbers out there. Women in tech to begin with is uh, the numbers are pretty abysmal, right? And um, it was really important for us to say, if you are trying to create a culture of diversity um, where people are represented in the right way, it's important to kind of make this happen from a top down as well as a bottoms up perspective. Um, and again, especially in tech, you find that there are very few women um, that actually get promoted at the pace at which men get promoted. Um, so in many organizations that do tend to talk about diversity, if you take a closer look, you'll see that there aren't too many uh, women in positions of, you know, directors or VPs or, you know, CXO roles. And so I think, you know, creating that kind of top down, bottoms up kind of a structure right off the bat from day zero um, really helped us to kind of make that into a cultural thing over time, rather than it being something that you have to do as a side project, right? Um, having diversity as a side project never works. It has to be woven into the DNA of your company when you're starting to uh, kind of pursue it. And so that's one of the ways we did it. We often, from a challenge perspective, when we were doing this top down, bottoms up, we often heard from a lot of people that, you know, pipeline is an issue. Um, building bottoms up is incredibly hard as well as top down because it's very hard to find women leaders, you know, who are senior enough or women in tech that are available in the pipeline. And so for us, one of the ways we overcame that challenge is by actually going out there and starting to look at women across very, very different kinds of backgrounds and disciplines and across different countries. We've got women from Spain, women from Japan, women from the US, from India, from many different countries, from UK, uh, Germany. Um, and, and, you know, this whole idea that the pipeline doesn't exist, to be honest with you, is actually not true at all. There's, there's women in all kinds of fields and especially in the context of AI. I think it's incredibly important to not just look at, you know, hiring from a very kind of linear perspective, but to be very open minded that are journalists, there are um, people from all different backgrounds that are implicated in actually the building and the creation of AI. And that's kind of what we did as we started to build this out. The second part of it is life cycle. Um, I think it's not just important to hire women and create that environment. You actually have to look at it through the life cycle of a woman's life, right? What about paternity leave? What about maternity leave? I mean, we always talk about maternity leave, but what about paternity leave, right? Um, and and it's not just enough to implicate the woman in, in household care and childcare, but also implicate the men in there. And so I think investing in policy, I think was really important for us through the life cycle. And the last thing, of course, is training and upskilling, right? Constantly making sure that um, the women in our company are trained and upskilled, and as well as the people coming in through the pipeline. So these were broadly the three things that we did uh, repeatedly over time to kind of get to this point. I'm taking down notes because it sounds so complex to be able to solve this issue. And you know, you mentioned the importance of investing in policy. So now Latifa. Oftentimes, people are under the impression that the talent gap is a problem of developing countries and that developed countries are ahead in ensuring women play a leadership role in the ICT sector. UNESCO's flagship publication, I'd blush if I could, underlined what the organization called the ICT gender equality paradox and debunked this myth. This paradox highlighted that countries that are closest to achieving gender equality overall such as those in Europe, have the fewest women pursuing the advanced skills needed for technology careers, and that countries with low levels of gender equality, such as those in the Arab region, have the largest percentage of women pursuing advanced technology degrees. That's very interesting. You were named by Forbes magazine as one of 100 brilliant women in AI ethics and as one of the women defining AI in the 21st century. And you're also training the next generation of women leaders in AI as assistant professor in computer information sciences in Saudi Arabia, as we heard from Ashwini, you know, the, the value of role models. So let me ask you, what can we learn from the Arab region in terms of 
how they have ensured a high percentage of women specialists in AI and in the region. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Natasha, and happy Women's uh, Day for everyone. Uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, and I didn't know that, what, that this is a real problem globally because we've grown up like without having this myth that this is a male profession. Uh, it's true regarding the statistics. We uh, almost uh, um, 56 percent, uh, according to the last statistics, that 56 percent from the graduate from the uh, graduates from the CS uh, college uh, is female. And this is, this percentage actually was there for decades. It's not just in you, but it's raising up uh, as well. Um, I wish if I could have a clear recipe to share it with you, uh, but it's related to many social, uh, cultural and um, economic uh, factors. Um, the girls in Saudi girls are very competitive when it comes to education. They don't believe that this, this is the, something related to male only. So they work hard uh, and um, reach really good, good results in, in uh, CS and the IT in general. Uh, and they also knew that this such, such um, a major in the college uh, is very important when it comes to profession in life, because it's not only regarded to one job, it's working in all the sectors. Uh, so they consider this as well. Um, and uh, giving their, 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 the overall skills that such um, profession is helping them uh, to, to get, uh, such as the logical thinking, the innovative and creative, and the humanitarian side. Some, some people thought that, no, this is IT. It's not so much social or humanitarian. But in fact, it has a very strong socio-economic impact. Uh, I saw the girls uh, uh, during the pandemic. They are doing a great job as data scientists and building uh, applications related to um, the uh, COVID uh, tests and the COVID vaccine and the social distancing and uh, competing in, in, in different uh, hackathons and uh, uh, competitions uh, as a researchers and data scientists to, to, to provide some results and helping in, in, in understanding what's going on and providing some kind of conclusion that might help the world uh, during uh, this time. So that's clearly giving me an insight of, of how this profession could help in, in many um, uh, sectors. Um, it's not only about the IT department. Uh, it's, uh, I, for example, last week, uh, my PhD student has just passed um, and defended her uh, thesis. She's, uh, she's from the law school and tried to uh, understand what's the relation between criminal law and uh, AI. So, and she was the first I think uh, girl or student uh, in, in, in the whole uh, uh, region who's trying to defend such kind of thesis. Uh, she started in 2017 talking about this topic. And also in other schools as well, we are working to uh, have a tech innovation um, uh, module or course so they can understand what's the relation between what exactly they are doing and how could they apply it for the future because things are changing even in other um, schools as well uh, that's from uh, uh, the schools and college side but we also are working um, the government saudi government is working really hard in this topic uh, many governments um, many entities in the government have established um, uh, acad uh, academy, digital academies, uh, for mainly for the reskilling and upskilling. Some of those academies focusing only on the uh, uh, developers. Uh, so they have almost 50% uh, of uh, the candidates are female uh, to work as developers. I think they are 17 years and up. Uh, from, from the front end to the back end and working on data science and IoT and cybersecurity and AI and different topics. Also for um, the employees in different um, government sectors, they are work, they, they have such um, uh, intensive courses, I would say, uh, and uh, that is related to uh, some topics um, uh, in order to understand uh, what exactly, how could they apply the, 
uh, some of those uh, new areas in their current work. So um, we also have a scholarship for supporting uh, female and, and AI and uh, data in order to uh, come back and help us within the uh, rapid uh, revolution that we are moving uh, uh, in right now and trying to draw the future with us. So this is like a, a brief of what's going on in terms of the training and education that we are uh, doing uh, uh, in, in Saudi to uh, help women specifically to understand the, and uh, take her role and move on uh, forward. Thank you, Latifa. That that section on governments and the need for governments to participate in this is interesting. And Najira, I actually love to hear more about this from you as well. You're a mover and shaker in the tech space in Africa and beyond, and were named as part of the BBC's list of 100 women. You've also served as a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation and deputy in the UN Secretary General's High Level Panel for Women's Economic Empowerment. Whew. Making sure that women play a lead role in AI design, development, and deployment isn't just an ethical question. As you know, it's an economic imperative. So how can we translate all the talk and effort in shaping norms and ethics into actionable and accountable actions across AI's use and deployment in the private, public, and even nonprofit sectors? Can you tell us a little more about how the public sector can play a role in ensuring and incentivizing more women in AI? To effectively tackle any issue, I think having a sound understanding of a problem is very important. Now, there's often talk um, of tech having a talent pipeline issue, which has been disproven as a myth, and Ashwini has also pointed this out. So that we're also hearing about this talent shortage in AI or women talent shortage in AI, which is just a continuation of a typical discussion that has been in the tech sector. Now, obviously, unequal access to education, including when and where women are likely to drop out or miss out on educational opportunities, inevitably affects uh, or affects rather the pool of experts, whether it's in AI or in tech. But let's even assume that a woman then defies the odds and is self-taught, um, they still might encounter recruitment bias when they go to, to, to ap apply for a role, where they might find a company is determined to hire people from a particular background, maybe people who went to a certain set of schools. Uh, and then this starts to perpetuate the, the biases we're seeing um, as far as the faces of tech goes. And here in my own personal experience, I've been I'm either pigeonholed as an Africa person or a development person, but not as somebody who can think and work on these issues uh, systematically and globally. I must always be pigeonholed. So if there is a pipeline issue, we would have to assume that all available experts are already hired in the state pipeline, which we are not. Now, I also think that the framing of these issues as an economic imperative narrows the understanding of them because they're also political, they're social cultural, as, La as Latifa was pointing out. And at this point, it's a moral question too. For all the years we've been talking about diversity in tech, I think it's a stain on actors from the companies to training programs to public policy. If all these efforts are not translating at this point with a newer technology like AI, despite all the economic arguments we hear made about why women should be included. And we must also recall that women were among the first coders and programmers, as the Hidden Figures book and film reminded us. But when a niche area gets um, generates economic value, women tend to be elbowed out. So if we're going to be talking about the role of the public sector uh, or any other actor who has a policy on trying to diversify um, their talent or making sure that women are included, we absolutely need uh, to start seeing gender responsive policies that accommodate these issues, that address gendered inequalities as they manifest um, and taking on intersectional approaches to make sure that we have sustainable efforts to reverse this trend of always having women lagging behind. Thank you, Nanjira. This public-private cooperation is so crucial. And Anne, the Women in Africa Initiative is one of the world's leading international platforms for the economic development and support of African women entrepreneurs. Can you tell us more about this initiative, its model in public-private sector partnerships and mentoring, as we've heard consistently from the other speakers, and its impact in raising the visibility and competencies of women entrepreneurs on the continent. What's the role of mentoring in this work? Thank you. So I will switch to French. 
from now, just to give. <laughs> so, je vais continuer donc en français par, uh, pour uh, plus de, de, de clarté. I will now speak in French. The Women in Africa initiative was launched in 2016 in order to shed light on women entrepreneurs in Africa. According to a study we published, 24% of women in Africa are entrepreneurs. So this rate is very low compared to other continents. 12% in North America, for instance, 6% in Europe. So Africa is a place for entrepreneurship for women. The desire to help them in their projects through various programs is essential for us. First, training, but also mentorship, as you said, because for us, training is important, but mentorship is also key because it allows women from different backgrounds to exchange their experiences. We also try to help give women a voice because role models, as you said earlier, are essential. So we try to use newsletters, TV shows, but also we organize events and we try to invite women on the stage. We organize more than 25 events locally in certain countries, but also globally, except for this year of pandemic. We organize a global event in Morocco, uh, in Marrakesh, and um, dozens of speakers took the floor to speak about women's status and position and entrepreneurship and one of the major issues is that we don't have enough data on women in entrepreneurship in ia in africa and on women's contribution to the Af african economy so we want to give these issues more visibility every year we launch a program that aims to identify women entrepreneurs. We received thousands of applications over the past few years. We supported 200 women entrepreneurs. We would like to support women entrepreneurs in each African country because we believe that we need to reflect the diversity of women entrepreneurs and the diversity of their situation. So we try to Um, help them and give them more visibility and give them a voice by developing their companies, their offer and supporting them as much as we can. That's fantastic work you guys are doing, Anne. Um, as, and going back to Ashwini, who's also doing incredible work in, assur in assuring that we have diverse people in the field. As CEO of Mad Street Den, Ashwini, you have underlined earlier, you know, that to a pipeline of female talent in AI doesn't exist means that people are looking for the wrong skill sets. You credit the diversity of your staff with the capacity to ensure that the products you develop are inclusive. Can you tell us more about the impact of your quota system in terms of your company and its products? You know, I'd, I'd like to briefly touch upon the concept of AI natives. This is something we talk about at Matri 10 all the time. It's, it's the mission of the company to basically create a world filled with AI natives. And I want to touch upon that here in the context of this question here, Natasha, right? Um, I think AI is not just about tech. I think AI is about people at the end of the day. Um, it's almost, I think, you know, if I had to get very dramatic, I want to say that um, it's almost like living with another species. And that's only going to get really kind of amplified in the coming years. Um, and the question really is, Who is a part of creating this, right? Who is a part of creating AI? Or are we just creating a series of, you know, um, communities of passive consumers of AI where someone else has the kind of decision on what it is that AI gets to impact? At the end of the day, I think anything that, that is generated using AI is basically impacting something. And the question is, Is it impacting it positively or is it impacting it negatively, right? And when it impacts negatively, you get all the bias and the and the harassment and the discrimination that we've been seeing for the last, I think, easily few tens of years across tech um, and increasingly so now with AI, right? Um, and when you have a more diverse group of people that are actually building AI or any kind of tech for that matter, 
um, you avoid all of those biases and you're creating a diverse entity. And especially if we are talking about thinking about AI as a whole species unto itself, the question is, who does it look like? Who does it represent? Who is it being created by? Who is it being controlled by, right? And we ask ourselves these questions every day at Mastery 10 as part of the products that we build and, and as part of um, the environment that we create. And this is why that kind of equity and diversity is extremely important because you don't want the same looking people from the same three schools to show up um, and create the same set of products. And, and we know that historically, right? The more creativity that you inject into a process, um, the more uh, people it serves, the more equitable that product or process or that technology piece of technology becomes. And for us, that has meant, you know, creating the kind of tech that is used by everybody from people, you know, retail workers and warehouses to stylists to product managers to increasingly with us launching our businesses and our platform into um, healthcare and education and many other verticals increasingly, we're beginning to say see the importance of having teachers and doctors and nurses and all kinds of professionals actually be a part of actually using these tools to create and make certain types of decisions, right? And, and the more diverse, and we've got stylists in our company, we've got increasingly people that are, you know, specific to different domains. We work with people in education, people in healthcare. And so building that kind of diverse community, I think for us, is just, it's, it's kind of a uh, baseline. There's, there's nothing without that in the company. I love that. And, and thank you for reminding us that AI is not just about tech, it's about people at the core of it. Uh, and speaking of avoiding biases, as you mentioned, the Women in Africa Initiative just launched this morning in cooperation with UNESCO, a survey targeting women entrepreneurs in Africa to learn from them about what their needs are in terms of training, to be empowered to incubate AI-based in innovations in businesses across the continent. And this feedback will lead to a massive open online course targeting women entrepreneurs across Africa. And can you tell us more about why this training is necessary and what you hope the impact will be? Merci. Uh, donc, en effet, comme je le disais uh, tout à l'heure. Indeed, uh, as I was saying earlier, Africa is a land of entrepreneurship for women. We were hearing 24% of women entrepreneurs much ahead of the figure in uh, other parts. Another point being that uh, women entrepreneurs in Africa are trying to have positive impacts on society. Interestingly, 84% of them when polled said, I am an entrepreneur because precisely I want to have a positive effect, perhaps on my village, on my country, on the continent, whereas the corresponding figure for men when they were polled was only 48%. And you can see this when uh, you look at the types of startups uh, that are uh, uh, launched by uh, women that might revolve around, say, agriculture, education, things which are highly relevant for uh, the continent. But a little bit like what you see in Europe or in the US, uh, in the startups tend to be much less technology focused when they're founded by women than by men. And we think that may be a weakness. In fact, the women, when we talk with them, tell us that they do need training with technologies. They feel confident about soft skills, team management, client management, but on technologies, they feel a little weaker. And so oh, we were thinking, you know, given the huge uh, diversity and extent of the continent with some 54 different countries, very contrasting realities, that AI could perhaps be a relatively positive form of leverage to uh, roll out very diverse kinds of training focused on women uh, entrepreneurs. And we feel that through AI, we can accelerate the development of companies and also boost uh, the ability to take advantage of all the features it offers, translation to local languages, the ability to uh, diagnose the situation of women locally so as to come up with truly tailor-made uh, training programs so that we can accelerate the development of these firms. Because what we've been seeing is that when you do give these firms the ability to extend their reach, their impact across the continent, then they are uh, in a position to develop more. 
So we see it as a, a very real need to work more closely with women entrepreneurs so that we can offer solutions, support in uh, the uh, development of the firms and more broadly of the economy across Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. It's a recurring theme, this theme, this need for training. And Latifa, let's talk a little bit more about the importance of that. Your work has centered around best practices in AI fairness and the importance of cultural diversity in applying AI fairness. Can you tell us more about this approach? How important is training and why do you think uh, this approach of cultural diversity is important? Um, thanks, Natasha. This is actually part of my work with uh, the web uh, GFC uh, for AI for Humanity. We are focusing on AI fairness. Um, as you know, AI bias uh, stems from human bias. And the human bias has a different um, background on social and cultural bias, where we don't have the same bias uh, in, uh, in worldwide. Uh, some of them are similar, but most of them are different. Uh, so uh, let me give you an example. Uh, for example, if, I, if there's an application or AI application that works just perfectly uh, and built for perfectly for bank loans, for example, or for real estates, um, uh, but it's implemented in, in the UK, for example, uh, I'm thinking of what will happen if I just directly brought uh, both this kind of AI application and uh, just build it uh, and check and use it here in Saudi. Um, it's not always that when you have correct results in, in, uh, within some uh, uh, in such algorithm uh, for some part of the culture that the tool works perfectly for the other, other culture because at the end it depends on the data. So if the algorithm is working well, you still need to check the data uh, and and see if it if it might give you the same or biased results even if it's working well in, in other uh, uh, domains or culture. So this is what I want to raise up uh, that uh, it's, uh, fairness is, just, is related a lot to the culture. It's also related to the sectors. Some sectors do not have that much bias or importance to uh, clarify uh, um, the need for, for such. Let me give you an example again for marketing, for example. It's not that important to focus on the, uh, the bias issue um, uh, for in, in the recommendation, not as uh, when it comes to, uh, to criminal law or evidence law in, in, uh, in some um, uh, other sectors. Uh, so what I want to say is that, technically speaking, gender bias is um, a bug. Uh, and we need to uh, ensure um, to provide some explainability for the outcome because the explainability will show that where the bias come from and uh, it will show that it is unfair and if it's unfair it's it's untrustworthy and, it, and as, a, as an ai system it fails so um one of the tools and application and approaches that we are trying to focus on um is to help governments and um business to have an AI ethics officer or AI governance to tackle the issues related to the development um, of an AI system, making sure that it is human centered, making sure that it is inclusive, uh, having the stakeholders that you need, make sure that women is in the loop, uh, assess your, your, your data, of course, uh, check if there's a conscious, uh, a conscious or unconscious bias in it. Um, ensure that explainability is there because it's very important, and especially in some business. Um, uh, also, uh, even after deploying the system, make sure that you, you get receiving feedback from your customers because that's at the end, it's important for your um, business and business reputation. There are some uh, tools that is related to help, but not really uh, give accurate answers, but help in, in, in um, uh, giving you an estimation for the bias by identifying criteria or metrics that is related to um, cultural, social, and uh, some uh, legal, political uh, uh, factors that you accumulate together and uh, give you an indication of whether that, that system is fair or, or needs to be re-evaluated. Um, fairness is a really complicated issue and it's really very difficult and we need to work on to uh, improve it in, in general by research and finding where how to improve this bias issue in general when it comes technically. So 
and that's why we need a lot of women in this in this uh, area because their voice is very important their work is very important important in the indication thank you thank you latifa this conversation is obviously very interesting so i i want to invite participating media on zoom to ask your questions on the chat you can put your name sure. and affiliation in the q and a section there's a lot that we want to follow up in all of these things that we're talking about unfortunately we are <laughs> following time so let's let's revisit sure. these in the q and a but uh, for participating media please feel free to put your questions in nanjira uh, you were previously the Digital Equality Advocacy Manager at the World Wide Web Foundation and led the women's rights online work that comprises a network of gender and digital rights organizations across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. From your perspective, what are we missing out on in terms of fulfillment of digital rights if women are positioned as consumers and not producers of AI-based innovations? We're missing cross-disciplinarity and gender responsiveness in designing and implementing policy and programmatic interventions. And this is an issue across all sectors. Now, while it's invisible for any one program or for any one sector to take on the entire range of challenges facing women today, it is possible to target our interventions but while avoiding optical illusions along the way and a siloed thinking. A digital skill, skills training program, for example, will operate very differently and even use very different metrics and timelines for success if it's encoded in an understanding that we end up with fewer women in AI, which is really a downstream effect because women are still denied access to formal education in some places, are discouraged through any range of social cultural norms from pursuing or sticking with the sciences or any other training that would get them into the sector, and I will still face any manner of biases in the recruitment process and in toxic workplaces. Then we also have a problem with the kinds of interventions that are designed by various actors and how resources are allocated. You tend to see um, solutions now being pitched as stuff like online GBV hackathons, which will have limited utility, especially if the solutions that are proposed in those kinds of flashy events are not going to be submitted continually for implementation in the communities uh, that are, that are, that are uh, supposed to enjoy these uh, issues, uh, solutions. Or reducing uh, ex research on women's experience in the tech sector to just having numbers to cite, oh, we've improved by 1% or reduced by, uh, by 2%, doesn't necessarily make life any easier for women if there aren't any requisite follow-ups on uh, especially the kinds of recommendations made in research. So if we can get more coordination across development, across tech, across educational and even political sectors to ensure that we chip away at this behemoth that is women being left behind, we can start to make progress. Uh, women's economic empowerment, for instance, must factor the social cultural norms in sustaining women as contributors to the economy, which mean, means we might need to reform how economies work. And lastly, that digital rights are absolutely drawing for what we consider as offline rights that women are able to enjoy, which they're not able to right now. These are political, civic, economic, social and cultural rights of women in a digital age. That offline online link remains still very critical in shaping interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Nanjira. Such important points. And, you know, it, it seems almost intimidating. Uh, especially for people like me, perhaps, who might not have this deep AI background. But I want to bring it back to Ashwini, because Ashwini, you come from a non-tech background, and you've been inspired by our, your experience in the culture field as a dancer and also by anthropologists. As a product leader working at the intersection of sociocultural and technological systems, you've also been exploring how AI can be brought out of the science and tech labs of the world and applied more meaningfully and made accessible to billions of people across the world. How can we make sure that AI is not only applied meaningfully, but developed meaningfully and inclusively? What, what is still missing? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, developing AI goes back to that idea that everybody at some point needs to, fit, you know, be an AI native which means you need to understand how these systems work. You need to have tools at your disposal to actually design and uh, design for your needs. Because at the end of the day, I do think that it comes down to understanding a problem. I, if you just step back from AI for a minute and just look at it as a piece of technology, right? And look at it as, as a tool that's in someone's hands, it still has to be applied somewhere. Where is it going to be applied? 
who knows about this product about the problem which problems are being uh, you know uh, focused on and i think the more creators you have the more uh, developers and designers you have of of ai the more it's going to get applied to problems that uh, not everybody is going to think of not uh, you know your usual corporate companies across the globe are probably not thinking about right um and so the question really does come down to how do you democratize this process and and put it in the hands of people of of all kinds and this is kind of goes back to my to my statement that ai is not about it's not so much about the tech as as much is as it is about um people we want to see you know like i said people in healthcare people in education people in in different fields actually actively beginning to use um ai and it and and in order to do that i think you know what's missing one uh, sponsorship um the the percentage of women being funded is uh, pretty ridiculous um give and i often have to tell myself it's 2021 um so i think you know really starting at the at the top and focusing on um you know this from a sponsorship and funding perspective second part of it is boards why don't we see enough women in boards right because a lot of decision making happens at leadership levels happens at boards and trying to understand especially as we start to look at more and more ai companies how do we have women represent not just in in the you know within those organizations but also in the boards to help shape the direction and the journeys that these companies have whose input i think is going into the ai i think you know many of the other speakers touched upon that that as well but at the end of the day how do you actually root out bias by nipping it off in the bud by having the right people actually create it and and influence the algorithm and then the last but not the least you know and i and i say this by giving a lot of emphasis to the the idea of a life cycle is that it's not just important to get people into the industry it's actually really important to keep them and you know a lot of the points that anjira said when it comes to you know how people are still living at home how women are living at home child care you know issues relating to family care issues relating to access to opportunities there are so many systemic issues that need to be solved and so you know putting a focus on actually holding on to women in these fields and in these in in ai i think is just as important as it is to actually bring them in important points and let's talk about money we talked about funding you mentioned funding and there is a lot of talk about putting your money where your mouth is and the woman in africa initiative with the support of the private sector is developing an impact investment fund to specifically fund and incubate african women working in the ai field tell us a little bit more about this fund and why does the private sector need to be on board well, in Africa, it's absolutely essential. We can see that women make up very important parts of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. In 2020, there was a study that showed that African startups got $2 trillion, of which only 13% went to women. And we know that women entrepreneurs in Africa make up a very substantial part of the economy nowadays. So we have a duty there to make sure uh, that uh, women get help. We know that technology is costly, that development calls for resources, infrastructure, data, skills, none of which is available without funding. So we have a responsibility again, if we want to ensure that these women can be uh, empowered and have the autonomy to reach out to wider markets, we need to make sure that we can do this. And that's the next stage in the development of women in Africa. We've heightened visibility, we've uh, identified the skills today, we need to fund them and ensure that they can extend their activities as far as possible, because it's intolerable to imagine that they would be content with such a small part of the it's the same everywhere, but uh, it's uh, not as unacceptable as, as, as in Africa. Now we have this initiative with a big community, so it's possible for us to raise funds and help women in this development, and in particular in the uh, AI technology development. Uh, and again, this costs a lot of money, it takes time, you have to test, you have to understand, you have to get the right data, and that's not easy. Surely not. Very complex. Latifa can hopefully talk a little bit more about how things just need to come together to be able to make this happen. Government, for example, has a key role to play in ensuring 
policies to promote women in AI. Latifa, you've worked as an artificial intelligence advisor to the Saudi government, leading the national strategic direction of AI and AI governance. I'm sure you can share some insights. Can you tell us more about the role gender equality plays in the development of these policies and what can be done more by the public sector, perhaps to hold the private sector accountable and build a startup ecosystem in AI favorable to women and gender equality? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think Saudi has a unique experience because um, when it comes to AI strategy and other tech strategies, um, because now we are actually uh, is, is driving a huge and massive um, transformation in gender equality. Um, we are that, that's for the basic for for gender equality policies in general. So uh, we are doing some uh, uh, legal uh, reforms uh, that helps a human, as according to the Crown Prince, he clearly mentioned that we, need, we really need to focus on all the issues that has uh, passed uh, for, for, for women previously. And um, also, uh, 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 there are new policies that is related to the labor market. The, when they announce any job, it should be for, for uh, both gender. Um, so that's happening in parallel of the huge digital tr transformation as well that we are doing. Um, we are trying to change these social norms, these social values about gender and about women. Uh, and because, as I told you earlier, it's we cannot get rid of uh, get rid of any AI bias without starting from the human bias. Um, as a, as government support, it's uh, the government, the Saudi government is doing a rapid uh, actions when it comes to um, uh, women empowerment. Uh, we uh, the government established um, the beauty ship department under the labor ministry to keep a track on 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 the market and the employment for the women in general, and another department that is specifically for um, women in in IT. So they want to ensure that all the women who are graduated from the IT uh, departments are really working in the IT uh, fields and uh, they are pushing the companies and try to understand what are the obstacles for those women and uh, how co could they, uh, in collaboration with the private sectors and others, uh, helping to overcome those obstacles and um, uh, improving the percentage of collaboration of women in, in the uh, IT. Uh, they also established data governance office in all the um, uh, departments, the government, uh, the government departments uh, that tackles uh, AI uh, data policies in general, which includes data bias and um, quality of the data. Um, uh, that has an impact on the uh, private sector, which helps in at least to connect the uh, uh, ecosystem together. Uh, we have leaders now in um, some of uh, the IT uh, companies, uh, Saudi leaders who are leading strategic action or um, initi initiatives that is related to the government. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, faculty in the academia are participating um, as uh, the, uh, participating their projects in uh, in other governments projects and uh, sometimes they are doing competitions and we see women who are winning these kind of competitions uh, that is related to innovative uh, solution for some of the uh, uh, problems that is happening in uh, in any kind of projects or sectors here so this is this is why i see it's very important to just give the woman uh, the green light that she can do and she will participate and she she will do amazing amazing job and and uh, in, in different sectors um that's uh, um, but we still have an issues related to um women's in leadership uh, as what uh, ashwani said um well, they are still not in, in the boards um, so we, uh, together with the labor market, they, uh, the, sorry, the labor uh, ministry, they established um, uh, a course related to women in uh, leadership, and making sure that uh, uh, women who are uh, who are related to um, or came from IT backgrounds to part to help to help them actually to uh, work with them um, to take such a course and uh, understand some leadership requirements or skills to participate in um, leading, uh, either having their own companies uh, or, or uh, helping in leading uh, other private uh, companies or IT private companies in the market. 
Latif, I'm interested. So the policies, yeah. I'm, I'm, policies are there, so just we need the actions now. Yeah. Right. The importance of the actions to actually enable these exactly. to progress. I'm interested in what you said about making sure we tackle obstacles so that those women who graduate from IT departments do end up working in IT. Exactly. Fields. Exactly. Nanjira, can you let, let's talk a little bit more about this? Figure eight reported that many companies hiring experts for AI and data science jobs estimate that fewer than one percent of the applications they receive come from women. And this speaks about what Latifa said. And even recently, Google's AI pages listed 640 people working on machine intelligence, but only 60 were women. And as we've been hearing throughout, this has an impact on the sector, but also in the algorithms. You are an advisory board member of the A Plus Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms, dedicated to building a free, feminist, and inclusive digital future. As part of this work, you advocate for the establishment of a baseline for digital equality. What does this baseline look like exactly? And how would it impact talent retention, as we've been discussing, and visibility of women working in this space? As I explained in an interview with the World Economic Forum, uh, digital equality is about dissecting the analog and digital aspects of political, social, cultural, and economic dimensions in society today. And then ultimately striving to ensure that we do not widen inequalities through digital technologies. We end up with digital gender inequalities in talent and in even access to the digital tools that we use today because we often overlook the analog antecedents that determine who gets access and who doesn't. Now, to impact talent retention and visibility of women in tech and AI more specifically, I think first and foremost, we must dispel of the notions that are, or that are in place that the onus is solely on women to step up and do more. This lean-in mentality does not have universal application. I cannot lean in any further if I am actually credentialed or not, but I have the skills, yet I'm going to come up against a, recruited, uh, a biased recruitment process. I cannot lean in any further uh, if I keep tweeting or TED talking, but it doesn't, it's not going to guarantee that I'm the one who's quoted or I'm the one who's cited. It has to wait till it's a man or somebody who looks another way. I cannot do how much more can I lean in in that case? And that's why we talk about activities like citing women uh, or having companies pay more attention to the language they use in job descriptions that can inadvertently signal that there's a particular role that is not ideal for a woman. We need institutional and political reform over and above individuals, uh, individual women's effort in positioning themselves if we're going to tackle these biases. Thank you so much, Nigeria. We have so much to talk about and we have a few minutes for Q&A, so can I invite all of the panelists, please, to join us and open, uh, turn on your screens. Everyone can see your beautiful faces. Um, and for the media joining us, question and questions are open. Please send them to us, and let's start this conversation. Um, in the meantime, can we also uh, invite Gabriella and Kay? to please join us while you are with us. And uh, Kay, if I could uh, ask you the first question. Uh, could you tell us a little more about gender equality in the framework of the recently launched Gaia Alliance? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think it's really important, you know, just hearing what everybody has been saying today. And Nanjira just said, you know, I can tweet as much as I want. I can keep putting my voice out there. But unless um, either I'm male or I'm picked up by the media, then I'm not going to be heard. And I think that's one of the things that every boy, every woman who's on this call probably feels frustrated about. And so one of the things that we are hoping that Gaia can do is provide a home and amplification to the various things that we've heard about today um, at this uh, on this uh, meeting. And so we know that there is fantastic work being done by women and others 
out there in AI. But what we haven't seen is um, the ability to bring it all together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to bring international organizations like UNESCO and UNICEF and the OECD to bring governments, to bring academics, civil society, and the businesses who we want to employ women together. And that's really the notion that we have with Gaia. Let's work together to solve some of these problems because together we are truly strongest and we can make our voices count where they need to count. Thank you, Kay. And on the topic of, of the importance of everyone sort of playing their part in this, Gabriella, can you tell us a little about a little bit more about the role of gender equality in the standard setting instrument UNESCO is preparing on the ethics of artificial intelligence in particular? Yes, for sure. And, and I'm very, I'm very um, uh, proud to say that this is not the first uh, contribution that UNESCO is doing for the AI world and women. The, the fact that we have a chapter that is really solid because we're not just saying that uh, there are women gaps and there are gender gaps of all the things that we have heard on skills on representation on participation on technological developments. And we are going directly to concrete solutions. We are going directly to what the speakers have been saying today, uh, give finance, ensure that there is equality in finance, ensure that there is uh, the pipeline that we go for more girls in, and, and we are the organization that is dealing with, with education, ensure that there are more women on board. More, but more than anything, ensure that you have a diverse workflow. Because the fact is that you cannot leave diversity if you are not diverse. And so, and so the chapter that we have there on the gender equality issues are dealing with very concrete mandatory, mandatory aspects of this agenda. And just by being there, Natasha, I think that we're making a contribution because the, the, the ethics of uh, AI recommendation is dealing with the whole work of, of ethics because the reality is that these technologies are not inclusive, not only for women, <laughs> are not inclusive for many nationalities, for many countries, for many regions and for many industries. They are highly concentrated. Uh, we know that 200 firms are, are producing 77 of the patents globally and we know where these uh, firms are located. So the recommendation is dealing with everything, is dealing with data governance, is dealing with the question of uh, education in general, is dealing with the, with the privacy and all of the, all of the elements that are worrying about the developments of artificial intelligence. But we are putting this gender chapter to deal with gender issues, but actually to make artificial intelligence more inclusive. The, the, the proof of the pie is that if, if you have women in the teams, if you have women in the industry, you are going to have an industry that is good for women, but it is good for everybody because it's going to be more diverse and it's going to be more inclusive. And so I feel that when you hear this information, when you hear hate speech, that is another angle that UNESCO is dealing with, when you hit biases algorithms, when you see that they don't recognize black women or black men, or that whenever you use uh, uh, algorithms, you favor uh, uh, certain uh, typologies, I feel that this is really providing with a very solid basis. What is the fantastic news? That is 193 countries. And we're also working with the platforms, the big platforms from the US and from all over the world. So it's a multi-stakeholder, multicultural, multidisciplinary. And, and, and one of the aspects is the gender agenda. And through the gender agenda, we want to make artificial intelligence more ethical and more aligned with human rights and human dignity. It sounds like a massive undertaking and everyone as we've been mentioning over and over needs to be involved but especially governments and it seems to be that, that the audience is listening in there's one question from youtube wants to talk a little bit more about this as again the the need for governments to to join in so we got one from youtube from our audience asking to the panel 
What are your ideas to encourage governments to provide support for young women students and entrepreneurs? And this to me is also personally very interesting because governments are obviously dealing with so many different issues amid a pandemic and, and money just can only go so far. So how do we encourage governments to be more involved in providing support for young female students and entrepreneurs? This is open to the floor. I'm I happy could, to, to sort of, okay, okay. No, no, you go. I've already said <laughs> It's something. always fun this way. You know, one way I think is really through the multilateral system and, you know, having you, uh, the UNESCO and WEF here is a good way to say we need that international pressure and especially for governments that are lagging behind on this issue. I think there's something to be said about the kind of um, solidarity that can be built for those who are still being left behind because it is a moral stain today that women would be denied access to education anywhere, let alone access to opportunities in sectors like these. So if we can have that, that the heat turned on in the UN and the UF system, that would be very helpful. Maybe I add something to this. Uh, maybe we should also uh, um, talk about uh, AI in a more simple manner. It's just one point in the topic. Uh, uh, it has to be desacralized. Uh, you, when you talk about AI, you have to have uh, people who understand the company, the, the purposes and so on. And this is why we have to have diversity to create tomorrow's AI. So we technologies increasingly are uh, more user friendly and so people are going to be able to use it like excel 25 years ago not many people could use it but today everybody uses it and i think it'll be the same for ai tomorrow but we have to make sure that there are people who are going to uh, continue looking into the algorithms uh, who are going to have this the technical skills to give some meaning to all of this and the ethical part of the algorithms as well so i think it's important to explain that this is a uh, that AI is a very big family. It's not just a technological a technology issue. Thank you, Anne. And, and Kay, did you want to add something onto that? I was just going to add about the startups. We've been working with a lot of countries, and it started with the UK. Um, on procurement of artificial intelligence. And one of the things that is really important, if you are thinking about creating an ecosystem with AI, is to think about how you bring those startups, how you encourage those startups to actually sell to government and be part of that um, ecosystem of success. And so that's a great area where we can encourage young women starting companies, getting VC funding, and being part of selling ethical AI to government. And so I think that, you know, there are lots of steps there, but we need to be keeping our eye on all of those steps so that we can ensure success. No, no point starting a company and having nowhere to go with it. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Ashwini, Latifa, and Nanjira for your time. It's been so educational, especially for, for me, who uh, I, I know about AI, obviously, but in this level, it's just so amazing to have all of you in one room to discuss this. And I'm excited to actually start our second panel. And we have even more things to talk about. This second panel is dedicated to discussing the challenges of algorithmic bias against women and AI-based solutions that can equally address this bias in the analog and the digital world. So while I talk to you a little bit more about what to expect for this panel, I would like to please invite the panelists to the screen for our second panel. While I wait for you to join, let me talk a little bit more about the data behind the inequalities. Leading research company Gartner predicts that in 2022, 85% of AI projects will deliver erroneous outcomes due to bias in data, algorithms, or the teams responsible for managing them. 
UNESCO's seminal report, I'd blush if I could, showed that AI-powered voice assistants like Alexa and Siri, which I'm sure we all use, perpetuate harmful stereotypes of women as submissive and subservient. This panel will look specifically at what can be done to design bias out of AI systems, perhaps a male, Siri, or an Alex. <laughs> Innovative AI-based solutions to address issues related to women's safety and security in the analog world. And to talk about all of this, I'd like to introduce you all to our panelists for the second discussion, Adriana Bora, AI ethics researcher at the Future Society and Applied AI Specialist on AI and Human Trafficking. We also have Meredith Broussard, Professor of Data Journalism at New York University. Wanda Munoz, Inclusion, Victim Assistance and Humanitarian Disarmament Expert, part of the Human Security Network in Latin America, CELAC. And Yuta Williams, Responsible Machine Learning Lead at Twitter. Welcome everybody. Let's get started. Adriana, could you join me on screen, please? Hello. Hi. Hi. Your work is dedicated to harnessing AI to accelerate the eradication of modern slavery, disproportionately affecting women and girls. Through your research, you're applying machine learning and analyzing and benchmarking the business reports published following the Modern Slavery Act from the UK and Australia. Can you tell us more about your work and how AI is being used to expose injustice? What is the role of women in designing such AI tools? And how do you see this project as a case study wherein AI can be used to concretely impact the lives of women and girls? Well, thank you. And first of all, thank you, UNESCO and the World Economic Forum for uh, organizing this event and offering the opportunity to celebrate International Women's Day Following this incredible panel, I'm so excited to be here and to present a bit more about the work that we're doing. Uh, my name is Adriana and I'm an AI policy researcher at uh, the Future Society and I'm the project manager of Project AIMS, which stands for AI Against Modern Slavery. There are over 40 million people enslaved today and an estimate of 25 million are in forced labor. Out of those, 16 million are working in the private sector. So given those shocking statistics, government, the private sector, the civic society are really putting pressure now on companies to take actions against slavery in their supply chain. So in 2015, the UK Modern Slavery Act came in force and in 2018, Australian government passed a similar law. So each year we have thousands of statements published by companies describing the structure of their supply chain and the actions that they're taking to ensure that their operations and products and all their supply chain is not linked to slavery. So at the Future Society, together with our partners, uh, Walk Free Foundation, Wikirate and Business and Human Rights Research Center, we use machine learning to be able to read and benchmark those uh, statements and really try to understand the status quo of reporting and what companies are doing against this crime. So we really hope that this is a good case study to illustrate how AI can be used to concretely impact the lives of women and girls. And to, to do that, let me break down a little bit those shocking statistics of 40 million. Today, we're celebrating International Women's Day. And right now, one in every 130 women and girls on earth live on modern slavery. In fact, women as a girl account for nearly three quarters of all the victims of modern slavery. Female accounts for staggering 99% of all the victims of forced sexual exploitation, 84% of all victims of forced marriage, and a 58% of all victims of forced labor, which end up in the global supply chain. So although modern slavery really affects everyone, there is no escaping for the fact that this is a very big gender issue. So I really invite you all to read a little bit more on this from a Stack Odds, a publication from Walk Free Foundation, where they showed the lifelong inequality, um, how it shapes from birth to the uh, old age, women and girls experience with modern slavery. So when we think about developing AI solutions, tech solutions against this crime, we really need to think about the need of domain expertise. We need to make sure that we develop AI technology uh, with the appropriate framework that includes the field expertise and ground intelligence. This will help inform the creation of the data sets as well as the features that we're labeling and then create our ground truth data that then we exponentially increase through the use of AI. So diverse participation in development of AI 
really should include lived experience and therefore it should include the survivors and this will help us identify the people that are in modern slavery but also to be able to identify the ones that are at risk of becoming enslaved so there is absolutely no question that women have to have to have a place at uh, this table and uh, especially survivor women in designing the solutions so in this time of covid i really uh, exacerbated the inequalities of women more than ever i'm really eager to learn more about how can we uh, collaborate with women survivors and include them in designing AI solutions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting the value of diverse participation and lived experiences. Meredith, you obviously talked a lot about this in your book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. In your book, you highlighted the limits of AI and techno solutionism and showed how its socially constructed nature replicates existing structural inequalities, particularly in terms of gender and race. What can be done to consciously design these biases out of the system? What tools already exist that should be further amplified or what do we need to build that doesn't exist yet in the technology and in the world? Thank you, Natasha. This is a really big question. Uh, one of the things that I write about is an idea I call techno chauvinism, the idea that technological solutions are superior to other solutions. And instead, what I would argue is that when we're thinking about technology in general, when we're thinking about AI specifically, is that we should ask what is the right tool for the task? Because sometimes the right tool for the task is a computer, and sometimes it's something simple like a book in the hands of a child sitting on its parents' lap. One is not better than the other. Uh, I think there are also a lot of misconceptions out there about what artificial intelligence is and is not. Uh, the Hollywood idea of AI is really deeply embedded in our brains collectively. Um, there's some level on which we, uh, we still imagine that AI is going to be like in the movies, like uh, it's going to lead to uh, the Terminator or lead to a robot takeover or lead to us all uh, losing our jobs to robots. Uh, and this is not true. We need to consciously differentiate between Hollywood images of AI and the reality of AI. And what's real about AI is that it's math. And this understanding of AI as math allows us to uh, get a more realistic grip on what AI can and cannot do, because there are certain problems that are social problems that absolutely can't be solved with math. Uh, they have to be solved by human beings. So let's uh, collectively kind of get a handle on AI and what its limits are, uh, in order to deploy it better and deploy it more equitably. One thing we can start with is we can start by looking at the training data that is used to train AI models, to train automated decision-making systems. And we can ask, is this data equitable? Uh, does it represent women in the data? Uh, does it represent trans and non-binary folks in the data? Uh, we need to double check everything, every data set we're using to train AI. Uh, and then the other thing we need to do is say, sometimes let's not use AI at all. Uh, there is a documentary out called Coded Bias uh, that I have a small part in. It follows the work of Joy Bolomwini, uh, who has a groundbreaking groundbreaking paper called, or project called Gender Shades, uh, which is about facial recognition and how facial recognition is better at recognizing men than women. It's better at recognizing people with light skin versus people with dark skin. And the takeaway from this is not that we should make our facial recognition systems better so that they recognize more women or recognize people with darker skin. It's that we shouldn't use facial recognition at all because these systems are disproportionately weaponized against vulnerable communities, especially communities of color. That's fascinating. And that's what we want to continue with Wanda now. You know, Meredith mentioned the Hollywood idea of AI, but also more importantly, instances where perhaps it's better not to use AI at all. 
Wanda, you are part of the campaign to stop killer robots that advocates for a ban of autonomous weapons. What is the role of AI in such weapons and what's the link between autonomous weapons and gender? Well, thank you, Natasha, and thanks also to UNESCO and the World Economic Forum for inviting me to this uh, panel with uh, our amazing colleagues. Um, I come from a human rights background, and I'm really glad that we can have this multidisciplinary dialogue. Now, I want to start by saying that I truly believe in the huge potential of AI to advance gender equality and more largely the sustainable development goals. Uh, but I got involved in AI because some people in, in countries that already have the largest arsenals of weapons came up with the idea that they should use AI in weaponry and literally create killer robots that are officially known as lethal autonomous weapon systems. I want to be very clear also that this may sound like science fiction or, or Terminator, like Mary did mention, but in this case, it is not. Autonomous weapons may take different forms, but their main characteristic is that they would select and attack targets without meaningful human control based on sensors, data input and algorithms. Those of us who work in humanitarian organizations never thought that we would need to mobilize against the weaponization of, of AI. And yet here we are, along with more than 4,000 AI scientists, the UN Secretary General, tech workers, governments such as Mexico and Austria, uh, calling for a ban of these weapons in international humanitarian law. These, of course, are unacceptable for ethical, legal and operational reasons that I cannot go into detail now, but if this these weapons were used, we believe that civilians would be at a higher risk of harm or even death as a result of an action determined by a robot that lacks, of course, the human capacity to analyze cultural context, uh, human solutions, and to understand what it means to take a, a life. In addition, given what we know about bias in AI, we believe that women, minorities, and marginalized groups would be uh, disproportionately affected by these weapons. Um, I'm going to refer to the study that Meredith had highlighted before by Joy Bull and Wimini, which demonstrate an alarming gender and, and racial bias. Um, the error rate in facial recognition in this study was almost 35% in dark skinned women compared to 1% in white men. So imagine what autonomous weapons with this technology uh, uh, could, could do and who, whom would they affect? Uh, even more possibly women, those with brown and black skin and minorities that are also underrepresented in AI, such as people with disabilities. We also know because of history that possibly these weapons could be mostly used in the global south or in the countries already in conflict. So imagine what would, what, how this would look like in countries like Syria and Yemen that are already facing massive humanitarian crisis, no? who are the likely to be the, the targets, uh, most possibly not those in the global north that are developing uh, these AI-powered weapons. So just let me finish with this. Evidence demonstrates from different sectors that when women have access to resources and to decision-making processes, the whole society benefits. We need to increase the participation of women in AI because we would have higher access and higher chances of ensuring that it remains focused on social goals uh, and, and our priorities rather uh, than uh, being used in weapons. Thank you, Wanda. Let's, let's talk more about this, this responsible and ethical use of AI and, and making sure women are involved to, to focus more on social goals. Yuta, you are a product manager for Meta, Twitter's machine learning ethics, transparency and accountability team. And as part of your job, you're analyzing how Twitter can improve its models to reduce bias. In Twitter, are there initiatives that build algorithms to address gender-based aggression online and gender equality in algorithms? And can you tell us more about that impact? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak to this August group. I'm truly humbled to be here with all of these amazing women. Meta is an organization that's focused on ethical considerations like gender bias, and it's part of our core mission. Uh, we're not alone at Twitter, though, and we have many teams that are focused directly on delivering safe and healthy conversations for all people. Um, specifically, as it relates to gender-based aggression, Twitter is committed to creating that place where we can be ourselves as ourselves. Our latest brand research confirms that people feel more free to be raw and open on our platform, and we take great pride in that. There's also a great responsibility that comes with that. When limited to 280 characters, and most people only use 33 of those characters on average, um, people can be blunt and even thoughtless. 
The sad truth is that when combined with anonymity, anonymity, rawness and bluntness can lead to aggression and abuse, which is experienced unfortunately by women more often and more profoundly than by men. Our hateful conduct policy states our non-tolerance for abuse very clearly. With hundreds of millions of tweets in different languages, it's hard to get this right all the time. But with the help of a large dedicated team, we've gotten much better at protecting people by building tools that help uh, our users take action very directly when they experience aggression and by increasing our proactive detection and removal of hate speech and abuse using um, algorithmic decision-making systems. To tactically address the question of equality and experience though is a complicated one. Eliminating bias in ML is not as simple as removing gender as a feature in a model. ML continuously learns from how people, regardless of gender, interact within a conversational context. What I personally observed is that women and men generally interact in public conversations quite differently. And our differences manifest in how ML treats us sometimes unequally. So consider a post that celebrates a new role or success. Women often use more emotive language and might focus on the humbling, state, humbling statements about the honor of an opportunity or respect for the team that supports them or the good fortune of an achievement. We may focus less on language that promotes the actual importance of that success. I've also observed that women tend to speak in opinion language versus expressing ourselves very factually. I think this panel is important sends a very different message from this panel is important. People inherently react differently to what is presented as a fact and their reactions in online communities become data. If important or factual statements lead humans to post comments or retweet when emotional or opinion statements garner likes, consider how signal for a ranking recommendation might not amplify women's posts if likes are less weighted than comments or retweets. AI picks up on this nuanced signal independent of the demographics of a person. And this makes finding the source for some of the demographic skew we might see a very interesting and difficult challenge. It's also important why forums like this are so important, where we can talk about how women are affected so we can examine the way we communicate about ourselves and our contributions that affect bias both online and in the real world. These biases are amplified by technologies like AI when left undetected and unknown. So thanks for hosting us and all these amazing women so that we can learn more about how to detect, detect these unintended consequences of AI. Thank you, Yuta. I'm guilty of many of those behaviors that you mentioned. And it's, it's fascinating to see how AI picks up on that quite, quite automatically. Uh, Adriana, let's, let's talk a little bit more about this on championing diversity and inclusion and the need um, for, for both of that. You're a policy researcher at the Future Society, a think and do tank dedicated to AI. And the Future Society recently released a report on responsible AI with a global partnership on AI, highlighting areas for future action to responsible AI ecosystem. So one of these areas is dedicated to respecting and championing diversity and inclusion. What can be done to champion these principles in the development of the algorithms themselves? Thank you. Um, well, the Global Partnership on AI was launched in June 2020, and it is this multi-stakeholder initiative that brings together leading experts and scientists from industry, civil society, academia, international organizations, governments, that share the same value that they want to bridge the gap between theory and practice uh, on support the cutting edge research uh, and apply activities on AI related uh, priorities. Um, the GPA activities are really looking at how to develop AI while it's still grounded in the principles of human rights, inclusion, diversity, innovation, and economic growth. So as you said, the Future Society was privileged last year to co-chair one of the GPA's working uh, groups on the responsible development, use, and governance of AI. Uh, the working group's mandate was to foster the con the and contribute to the responsible development, governance, and use of human-centric AI system while seeking to address the UN SDGs. And here I would like to take a minute to acknowledge that, in fact, from the Future Society side, we have this incredible senior AI policy researcher, an incredible woman, Nikki Liadis, who was the project lead on this. 
So the research that uh, Nikki, the team, and uh, the steering committee at GPI highlighted uh, that the lack of diversity in the existing responsible area initiative risks undermining their effectiveness and uh, credibility, as well as their actual ability to scale. Importantly, uh, it is perpetuating the existing inequalities and biases, uh, but also to misinform the priority of policy, which is extremely problematic, especially when we talk about the cross-regional collaboration. So this report maps the initiatives and then at the end comes up with recommendations. Um, and the, the recommendations are directly addressed to the GPI. Um, and uh, the, the recommendations are looking how GPI um, should shape uh, and spread the good the diversity and inclusive practices across the entire ecosystem. Uh, and uh, there are two main uh, recommendations here. And the first one is that GPI should develop and disseminate the good diversity and inclusion practices by GPI could, for instance, formulate inclusion strategy. GPI could encourage open access to information and infrastructure, or it could break down the communication barriers between geographies, geographies social groups, and disciplines. And the second and very important recommendation is that GPI could actually initiate strategic partnership with the platform that already collect re representative input. And as the previous panel has highlighted, and hopefully to the example of AI on modern slavery, we understand how important this uh, rep representative input it is in the design of algorithm. So here we talk about this very meta level high governance, but as all the panelists have discussed previously in terms of the importance of multi stakeholder international collaboration, the importance of having governments at the table, we know that AI algorithms are not developed in a vacuum and this creates particularly new governance challenges. So those recommendations that are targeting the GPI uh, will then hopefully guide uh, in the future the development of AI national strategies and national policies that would incentivize the increased participation of women in the entire AI ecosystem and chain, and therefore the spillover effect will be that the algorithms that are built by more diverse and inclusive team will be less biased. I love that. And let's let's bring it back and make it a little bit more personal. Meredith, let's talk a little bit about your personal experience that echoes this need for the participation of women, like Adriana mentioned. As a software engineer and data journalist, you yourself have had to struggle with the lack of diversity, not just in the tech sector, but in the tech itself. You've highlighted the implications of failure of self-governance on these issues in the tech community and argued for ethical and legal education of software developers to fight back against the bro culture. So what needs to be done in terms of regulation and legislation to successfully fight back against this bro culture and move from an emphasis on moving fast and breaking things to moving ethically and building inclusively. Uh, thanks, Natasha. Uh, this is such an exciting conversation to be involved in. Uh, one of the things that I always say when people ask me, well, what kind of policy can we write? What kinds of regulations can we write? Is I say there isn't a there isn't an easy answer but i'm right here and i am ready to write it so i'm just volunteering i'm putting it out there i am available to help write these things i uh, i would say that i have three recommendations the first is i uh, listen to all of the recommendations on this call uh, UNESCO and the World Economic Forum have brought together some amazing experts here. It has been such a joy to participate and to listen to all of these perspectives. Uh, and let's just take everything from this call and put it into practice right away. And that will, uh, that will get us going. The second thing that I would say is in the AI realm, promote women and pay them more. If one of the problems is that we don't have enough women in AI leadership, let's get more women in AI leadership and let's do it now. The third thing that I would say is that we need to regulate. Uh, regulation starts with auditing. Algorithmic auditing is one of those terms like infrastructure that is kind of complicated, but is extremely necessary. For many years, we've been pretending that 
cyberspace, that the digital realm is a realm that is beyond the reach of government. Uh, it's not true at all. Cyberspace is the real world. The digital world is the real world, and we should be treating it like the real world as opposed to pretending that uh, governments don't have any reach there. So one thing you can do is start by making sure that your AI systems are compliant with international human rights laws. Uh, another thing you can do is you can look at the regulations inside your industry, whether that's insurance or real estate or HR, and you can ask, are the AI algorithms being used compliant with all of the rules inside this industry? And this is a question that all of your vendors should be able to answer. Uh, you should be able to give them a list of these are the regulations that we uh, are concerned about, and they should be able to give you an answer about, yes, the software is compliant in this regard. No, it's not compliant in this regard. Uh, and that's the essence of algorithmic auditing. You can also apply certain ethical tests. So there's a whole field called uh, fairness, accountability, and transparency in AI. And uh, there are lots of toolkits available. Uh, I know that IBM runs one called uh, AI, AI 360, FAIR 360. I'm getting this name wrong. But at any rate, there is an IBM AI fairness toolkit out there. Uh, and there are lots of other uh, amazing toolkits that are coming out of the fairness, accountability, and transparency community to try and make sure that AI is ethical and equitable. I think that is just so crucial to discuss, this need for AI to be compliant with human rights laws. Let's hone in on that. Wanda, AI is being used for facial recognition technologies and police surveillance, for example and moratoriums have been set because of the discriminatory nature of such tech, particularly against people of color. Should women have specific concerns about the use of AI-powered technologies by police in the name of security? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question, Natasha, because uh, this is really a human rights and human rights issue, and that's really dear to my heart. So um, in short, yes, we certainly should be concerned and take action on this topic. Facial recognition technologies have already resulted in human rights violations, which have been clearly documented in the US and the UK, for example. The serious consequences of this problem were even recognized by some tech companies last year. In June 2020, uh, Amazon and IBM imposed a moratorium on the use of facial recognition technologies uh, programs by police forces, recognizing their unjust biases, particularly with regard to people of color. But in addition, these technologies can be used specifically to target women and human rights activists. I will give you one example from Mexico, where a local government decided to deploy facial recognition technologies in the city center to improve security. There are so many things wrong with this, but I'll just name a few. Firstly, there are many policy options that would be more effective and sustainable to improve security, such as fighting corruptions, strengthening the justice system, improving the working conditions of women and, and creating jobs, just to name a few. Second, it so happens that the first use of this technology was to identify not drug traffickers, not kidnappers, but women feminist organizations that were demonstrating against gender-based violence and specifically demanding justice for Alondra Gallegos Garcia, a 20-year-old victim of femicide. Can you imagine? I get so angry just uh, talking about this. In addition, the company that sold the technology to this local government is known for their security breaches and for products that are easy to hack. So the personal information of these women is now also available for who knows who, who knows where. This is an example of how AI-powered technologies can be used to threaten uh, human rights movements, in particular feminist activists, uh, as if there were not enough threats already. And one more reason why we need more women involved in these discussions. Similar technology for surveillance of the US-Mexican border has also been reported, and I cite to detect and identify items of interest. So here we see a case where we're not even talking about persons or even illegal immigrants anymore, but women, men, girls, and boys who cross that border and are among the most vulnerable are already being thought of as items or objects. And let me finish with three quick ideas. 
I think that we, as women in our diversity, we need to be able to influence decision making, no? including what policies are implemented, how government budgets are allocated and spent, and more specifically, how AI is being used. I can assure you that if there were more women in AI uh, and more women in government, we will have a better response to our real problems. AI uh, is already being used for topics such as uh, increased information about gender-based violence services, uh, information about agricultural products on the markets from the uh, project mentioned by Anne before, to facilitate communication for children with disabilities, or for example, to improve breast cancer diagnosis. This is what we need as women, among many other things, not surveillance. Um, just also let me add that, um, for me, the challenge is not just how to fix the algorithms, but who is deciding how AI is, is being used and how, like as Winnie said, we need to look at who is creating AI and who is being represented. And women should play a central role, even those of us who are not AI specialists, because this is not just about tech, this is about our society and our human rights. That Mexico case study is just unbelievable. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Yuta, let's go back to Twitter now and, and talk about this, this need for best practices in terms of gender equality, which Wanda talked about, right? Who is creating AI and, and what is the impact of that? What do you think is unique about Twitter's approach to responsible machine learning that others can learn from? Or what are some of the best practices, notably of gender equality, that could be scaled? First, I just have to say I got chills as Wanda was talking. That was just incredible. Um, so to get back to the question you asked is, you know, what is Twitter specifically doing? And you've asked my one of my favorite questions, which is, and probably the favorite question of all product managers, if I'm being honest, it's how to generalize learning so that it can be leveraged broadly and at scale to help lots of people solve problems. So the work we do at Twitter is both benefited by and challenged by the uniqueness of our platform. People come here to converse in public and to discover topics uh, to talk about very openly, and particularly those topics that are part of history being made sometimes in real time. The first practice I would mention is to partner with academia very meaningfully and to empower our partners and our critics with data. The public nature of our, of our data is that it makes it such that it's such a rich source uh, for external researchers and human rights advocates. And you all can leverage that with or without our help. But we've embraced the opportunity to help by releasing release the, uh, important APIs and tools that make research much easier to accomplish. I would say that our support for external research is unique and a best practice. And we benefit just as much as our researchers by being this open. Beyond that very limited data related support, we also really listen to our critics. Much of my personal learning about the impacts of social media and automated decision making on gender equality comes from these academic papers from people listening to this call and who are writing on these important topics. That said, there are some analyses that external parties simply can't do, including some A-B testing, perhaps, or user surveys, or maybe analysis that includes some proprietary information. In those cases, and in many cases, we partner with academic advisors and independent researchers to perform some of this work on their behalf, while encouraging publication of findings regardless of whether they're complementary to our company. I don't know that this is particularly unique, but being a willing partner is a, uh, is a really powerful tool that empowers even more external critique of where we could do better. Secondly, I would suggest that over the last couple of years, Twitter's taken an approach to building products in the open. A recent example of this practice is our birdhouse pilot, where we're learning very publicly about new ways to moderate content. So being this open um, allows us to get feedback very directly, and sometimes even in real time from the people who are actively using our products and features that might be in beta or pilot. So adding people to the open feedback loop is particularly important when we're assessing how classes of people are affected by some of our automated decision systems. Third, I'd say that our responsible ML products are applied by design. We believe in pure research and want to fuel that research, but my mission as a product manager is specifically to make sure great ideas become delightful product features and aren't limited to just publishing really innovative and interesting papers. So assuming implementation as a success criteria when we formulate our hypotheses is something that I also think is unique and very important for others to think about. And the last point I'd make, and I hope you'll all celebrate with me, is that we have a lot of incredible women here. 
The eng leader for Twitter's ML platform team, Ari Font, is a woman. The director of our meta engineering and data sciences team, Ruman Chowdhury, is a woman. In fact, four out of eight engineering VPs at Twitter are women. And I can assure you that this is very much the best of practices. Four out of eight, that is impressive. <laughs> um, and you know, you mentioned this open feedback loop, which I'd like to talk a little bit more about. Adriana, beyond your work to end modern slavery and your particular interest in how AI applications can progress human rights, support emerging economies, and achieve the UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, part of what, uh, Apologies. Um, and you're also interested in how AI applications can progress human rights, much like Wanda. Part of what is needed for AI to do this is to support global frameworks for open data, like Yuta mentioned, and AI commons, which the future society is already working on. So what is this relationship, in your opinion, between open data and transparency and accountability in algorithms with reducing gender bias in the development of algorithms? Sure. Um, well, thank you for this question. And I think especially with all the research that exists already and even just listening to this, uh, those two panels, I think it's very clear that something that we hear very often that gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, but actually the foundation of a peaceful prosperity that a uh, sustainable world, it is true. Therefore, we have learned already that the SDG 5 uh, with uh, gender equality intersects very deeply with the rest of the agenda. And I hope, for instance, with the example that I brought forward um, on modern slavery, it shows the intersection with SDG 8, the SDG under which modern slavery falls under. Um, so talking about the open data, when we work towards the SDG agenda, if we want to go anywhere near the, the, uh, the aim to reach it by 2030, we need to ensure that data is made available to, uh, to create the evidence needed to take decisions and then act upon them. So as, as you mentioned, I was very privileged at the Future Society to work on very interesting projects such as the Global Data Access Framework or AI Commons. And in those uh, frameworks, we are really promoting and advocating for the provision of infrastructure for data flows that needs to be um, to ensure to advance the work towards the achievement of the SDGs. Um, and from the experience with AI against modern slavery as well, um, if you go and listen to the panels, we're always running into the same problem of the data flows. Um, another interesting angle to take here is that there are actually AI applications that are particularly designed to tackle gender uh, imbalance. And th this incredible publication by Women in AI uh, on AI for Gender Equality was published in 2020, and they showcase all these use cases. And of course, in the challenges, once again, the data availability is, a, is listed as a huge priority because without this data, the research university, even the industry can't really identify the actual problem well enough to know what needs to be fixing. But I want to mention here that it's not only about sharing the data, so not only open data, but how do we do that that is in alignment with privacy, security, and consent, because a lot of this data is so sensitive. So we need open data frameworks that allows for this intersection. And I want to take one second to address your second part of the question, which is about transparency and accountability, which is fundamental if we want to, to, to achieve uh, more equality towards women and underrepresented minorities. Because we often hear that when we talk about AI algorithms, we hear about representation bias. But let me name another just a few others, evaluation bias, historical bias, measurement bias, aggregation bias, et cetera. And all of those are found at different stages in this chain of AI development. And therefore, if we only look at representation bias by increasing the, the women's representation in our data, then we ignore all the other biases. So th through transparency and accountability, we can stop at the right place in the uh, chain of development, the AI algorithms, to ensure that women are not discriminated uh, against. Thank you, Adriana. Before we continue this fascinating conversation, can we, I'd also just like to remind uh, media that you are 
welcome to ask any of your questions in the Q&A section. Just indicate your name and media affiliation, and we can go back to that in the Q&A section, which is coming up. But just to jump back into our conversation and what Adriana said on the value of privacy, security, and consent, Meredith, as a data journalist, you see firsthand the role, the right to privacy and full control over personal data and information online plays at every single level. How can we curtail practices by states and private companies to use data for profit and manipulate behavior, as well as surveillance practices to control and restrict women's body, speech, and activism? Well, I'm so glad you're framing it in terms of consent, because that is an incredibly important framing. Uh, we should all have more control over our personal data, and the use of our personal data should be based on active consent. Uh, right now, uh, companies just assume that they own your data and they can do whatever they want with it. Uh, and so we should flip that framing. Uh, I think the first thing that we can do uh, to your larger question is what we can do is it can support independent media. The markup, uh, which is run by Julia Englin out of the US is an excellent example of this. Uh, the markup does high tech investigations into algorithmic accountability. Uh, the media has always played an important accountability role. At the beginning of the digital revolution, we thought, okay, we can just like defund the media and uh, social media will take the place of the traditional mainstream media and we can crowdsource everything. And that is not the case at all. Uh, it was not true. We need to uh, revisit that kind of techno chauvinist thinking and we need to support independent media. Next thing to understand is that what engineers want is different than, uh, than what we may want in terms of designing AI that is uh, gender equitable. Uh, what engineers want to do uh, is we want to write once and run anywhere because you know, all computer programmers were kind of lazy and uh, we like to just write one code base. Uh, but if you are actually going to make technology that is responsible, technology that uh, does not perpetuate bias, you need to rewrite the technology for different contexts. You need to continually update it. And that's the opposite of write once and run anywhere. Uh, you need to write software that operates differently in uh, different states, in different contexts, in different countries. Uh, so you have to recognize that there's this tension there that engineers would like to write something and be done with it and make money off of it. Whereas what we need for the world is we need technology that conforms to the uh, social practices and the actual laws that are in place. Uh, a continuous evolution, if you will, I guess, of that technology. You building on Meredith and Adriana's reflections, you've worked extensively to develop data protection strategies. Formerly, you were also head of the US delegation to the International Standards Organization. You continue to support that group as a technical expert. And you've also worked with the US Department of Defense on large crypto system projects. What is the link in your view between security, data protection, and gender equality in AI? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have this very interesting experience of talking with ethicists in this space, and every person came to this role from a very different direction, which makes it a, a rich and, and interesting place to, to land as a profession. Uh, first, let me say that I joined tech uh, at a time when it was very lonely to be a woman. It was Internet 1.0 days. So my first projects were in identity management and crypto and cryptography, and they were early efforts to, to secure against external threats. But over time, we got really a lot better at preventing inappropriate access. So some of us could turn our attention to what exactly was appropriate access. So for me, security and privacy are two sides to the same coin. And the bigger the data needs, the more important both security and privacy become for companies to do well. 
Um, as we've looked at ML for a few years now, and we have some data and a real world experience to apply, we're, we're becoming much more aware of unintended consequences of using large data for purposes uh, that maybe automation wasn't the perfect selection for. As was the case for both security and privacy, really accountable companies are investing in this responsible ML practices space well before it becomes very mainstream. So the standards organizations like ISO and even publications from companies like or organizations like UNESCO, they fill a very critical consensus and interoperability gap when these technologies are new and legislation hasn't really caught up. But they also take many years to publish. So I'm also doing what I can to improve products very directly in the meantime. So I want to emphasize, though, that this isn't where we stop this evolutionary journey. And as we address the more basic human needs of safety, respect, inclusion from Maslow's hierarchy, we can't ignore the needs for self-fulfillment and happiness in society, and especially those that are online. Self-determinism, freedom, and personal agency are also critical considerations for how AI will evolve to support these much healthier, hopefully in the future, technology-dependent communities in the long term. So I want to live in this world where being labeled a woman, either explicitly or implicitly because of the way I talk online or shop or read news or comment on a funny video, this doesn't also diminish my value or deamplify my opinion. I think giving people more choice and agency in how signals are used to power their social experiences is a critical path. And I think that personal agency to tune our experiences with ML has just as much power to transform our place in an increasingly online and global society as family planning was able to enable women to seek an education or enter the paid workforce. It certainly made all the difference for me personally. Um, thank you, Utah. You know, what, what I'm getting from all of this is, yes, there's bias in algorithms, but AI is not a mirror of our bias. It's a magnifier. And in that way, we have an opportunity to redress both our technology and our societies. Wanda, AI in itself won't be a silver bullet that fixes a bias that permeates our analog world as much as it does the digital world. But what can be done in terms of AI-based solutions to hold everyone from the private sector to the tech community more accountable? Well, Natasha, this is one of the main issues of AI today, and we could discuss about this for, for days and months, but I have a couple of minutes, so I'll share five key points. First, we should continue the discussion on how ethics should be part of AI, but we should also go one step further and talk about human rights and international human rights law. I was excited to hear Mary refer to this and also to see uh, that human rights, fundamental freedoms and leaving no one behind are some of the foundational values of AI that UNESCO identified in its recent publication on AI and gender equality. Ethical frameworks, of course, are, are useful, but they are often used as guidelines, monitored by each company or institution, if at all. And even worse, according to this UNESCO publication, most of them are gender blind. Yet good practices in other sectors demonstrate that if you want to move forward in gender equality, you have to start by naming it explicitly by taking specific measures to address it. That's why we have a specific SDG on this. You cannot assume that gender is implicit in current wording and practices because most often it is not. It is also fundamental to ask, are these ethical principles being defined only by the same people who are supposed to comply with them? Do they include views from the global south? And what about um, feminist and intersectional perspectives? Otherwise, these ethical principles are probably just replicating the same systems of power that have led us to the challenges that we face today. Uh, two, we need to continue strengthening forums like the Global Partnership on AI, to which Adriana referred and which I have the honor of being part, and through the multilateral system. It is amazing really that uh, UNESCO and World Economic Forum are uh, taking the lead on this. We cannot rely on self-regulation because the social consequences of AI should not be left in the hands of an unelected few. Three, I think we need to reinforce uh, whistleblower protection mechanisms, uh, particularly in the private sector. And specifically looking at gender, we need to link to what is going on more largely in our societies. For me, one of the key messages is that technology is not neutral, it represents a culture. So we need to hold accountable those that are producing AI, but we also need to link to the social values and the laws and the policies that allow these biases to, to persist. As Judah said, implementation 
should be our success criteria. We cannot uh, remain just um, drafting ethical guidelines. And I want to finish saying that I see a great opportunity here because if AI is more accountable from a gender perspective with specific indicators, gender could actually be the spearhead on how to transform ethical principles in AI into concrete practices and thus promoting responsible use of AI more largely. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you for summarizing it in that way, too, as it leads us perfectly into our Q&A session. So can I invite Adriana Meredith, Utah, Wanda is already on the screen, to please join us so that we can start the Q&A. And Gabriella, uh, if you are still online, please join us as well for this Q&A. And we've gotten several questions. We've got one from Facebook to kick us off. Uh, we have a question from Alfred Rosier. This is for the panel. Do you think that with the massive use of social media by young people and the increasing issues that different platforms have triggered, Utah, perhaps you can talk about Twitter also, including targeted ads, loss of privacy, that more people will be interested in AI? Who wants to take that first? I'm happy to go very briefly, but I'd love to hear the other women's opinions. Um, I do think that people are becoming much more aware of AI in general and how it's used to fuel their experiences both online and in the real world. I think that if you haven't figured out how AI works in your experiences every day, then you're probably a victim to the AI in your, in your world more than you are empowered by it. So my suspicion is that this will become a very mainstream topic in short order. Forums like this help promote understanding of these technologies and how to make choices that are already available to you to tailor your experiences. And I hope that everyone takes advantage of the opportunity to take a look at uh, the controls that have been given to you to ensure that your voice is heard. Would anybody else want to add to that? Um, yeah, I'd like to just have a quick comment here and just I, I really um, love this this question, but I was maybe I just follow up with another question. Well, I think what, what do we do with not the young people that are increasingly using social media, but maybe with the older generation that are now using social media, but they're also less tech savvy than the generation, the younger generation that then becomes interested in AI. And I think we should think about uh, this, this uh, discrepancy between um, age and think about how um, maybe the younger generation still have an opportunity to become part of this journey of AI and then with because they might have the right support but what is going to happen with the older generation that maybe they don't even think that they have an opportunity to contribute to those discussions so I think this is another opportunity where we can look at the age as a discriminatory factor in the decisions of AI and think about how do we include that generation uh, at the table. Maybe, Nasha, if you, if you allow me, and I, and I have been uh, listening to this very interesting uh, conversation, congratulations, because we're getting a lot of uh, ideas how to move forward with the ethics uh, recommendation on AI of UNESCO. But I have to say that the, the, the question was interesting because it was saying, do you think that they will be more aware? It's not about the pervasiveness of these platforms that are going to raise awareness. I think that now we really have the responsibility of being more transparent and knowing that whenever you are lured into, into certain activities, whenever you are provided certain information that is targeted or profiled or because uh, the platforms or, or, or whomever is using these technologies want you to act in one way or another, uh, it's not about the elderly, it's not about the elderly. It's about the whole infrastructure that we have created not to make it transparent. That's why I feel it's very important that we really ensure that the principles that are there, I mean, the, the UNESCO recommendation has the principles, but, but so the OECD and so the Council of Europe, but we need to make it count. We need to make count explainability. We need to make count transparency. We need to get accountability, redressal mechanisms. And, and what we're talking about, and as I've heard of one that may, is just the rule of law, due diligence, redressal. When you're affected and, and you're not leaving to the automobile sector to decide whether they provide enough safety or not. No, you have certain regulatory frameworks that are very deep into the into the whole question. 
we talk about diversity, but let me tell you also that the question of, of uh, the, 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 how do you ensure that there are no uh, uh, reaffirming biases embedded into the technologies? Well, I would say just separate the teams. You cannot have teams that are doing the research, the development, the deployment, and then the impact assessment. I would say let's just create different teams that test how much they are solid uh, enough. And then because you cannot regulate everything because these technologies are very super fast, I know there needs to be more regulation that are very solid, but you cannot regulate everything. So what we're doing at UNESCO is also having an ethical impact assessment people can use with these questions of respect of human rights, these questions of respect of uh, gender and, and diversity. And so it's the whole infrastructure that we need to think together on how to improve it to deliver better. You know, I would it. also add to Gabriella's excellent, excellent summary here that AI is hard. There's a lot of interest in artificial intelligence and that interest spans generations. But if uh, you're learning about AI and you find a bite-sized explanation and you think, okay, I want to learn more about it. And then you go and learn more about it and you kind of slam up against a wall and discover that it's hard. That's because AI is really hard. It is mathematical, it is complex. And if you're not getting it right away, that's because it's difficult. There are things in the world that are easy to understand. There are things in the world that are more challenging to understand. And the things that are more challenging, you have to work at it. Uh, so I think a lot of people are surprised that AI is as complicated as it is. Uh, and so one of the, the uh, things I write about in my book is I do a plain language explanation of what AI is and isn't because it's an accessibility thing, because we really need to empower people to understand that this is hard, you can get it, but it's not going to be as easy as sending a tweet, for example. Uh, so this is a very important, just first understanding of what's going on with AI. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about this. Do you think, and this is for everybody as well, that the lack of participation of women in AI will lead to, because it's so difficult and, and whatnot, will lead to a tech clash and a rejection of technology? So I would say that I, we're, not, I, we're not heading toward any kind of rejection of technology anytime soon, nor should we, because technology is great. Uh, you know, technology is the reason that we can uh, send baby pictures around the globe. Uh, technology is the reason that we have uh, clean drinking water in so many places around the globe. Uh, technology is really important. The progress of technology is important. Uh, but what we should be thinking is how can we make our technology more inclusive, more ethical, and there is a tech lash going on. Since about 2017, 2018, uh, we've been talking more about the problems embedded in our technology, uh, especially in our social media technologies. And this is a really important conversation to have because we should not assume that technology is without flaws. We should not assume that because we're using more technology, it's going to make everything better, faster, and cheaper. We should put people first in the center of our decision-making and make decisions that are going to lead us toward a better world, as opposed to just replicating and magnifying the existing problems in the world today. Can I share some ideas? Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. From my side, I, I agree that I, I don't think that there's going to be a, a rejection of, of technology per se, but I think that there's a lot of work that we need to do uh, just to, to make uh, everything that's going on on AI more accessible. And I agree with Meredith that, that AI is difficult, but I think it's we have you, you can say that a lot of things are difficult, but that doesn't mean that we don't have the obligation to make sure that everyone who's going to be affected or who could benefit should have access to that information. In the framework of the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, there's a discussion we also had about how can we promote the trust in AI? 
And for me, I don't think that we can promote trust in AI as a concept, but we need to be able to, to make sure that people understand, first of all, that HI is not going to, to negatively affect me like in the examples I gave. But secondly, how, how can AI is going to impact positively in my life? For example, if you tell me AI is being used uh, in, as I said, to, to um, identify breast cancer better and more easily, ah, that would be, you know, excellent for me. Uh, and I think there are other topics, like I mentioned, of communication for children with disabilities and many others, where we just have to be able to explain how it's going to support you and to advance you in your goals as, as women, as in the global south, etc. Thank you, Wanda. Anybody else for that uh, on, on that topic? Yeah, well, I, I, I have to say that again, we're, we're saying we need to be human centric and we need to be looking at the goals, humanity and human rights. And, and we're always talking about the technologies. If there is going to be a technology backlash, if technology is going to be good or bad or a technology, I think we just need to see the impact, the negative impacts, because the positives will have them. And we need just to catch them and keep them and to and to use them. And that's exactly what we're doing. But the downsides, the societal impact of this lack of accountability in certain corners of the AI world is producing societies that are more fragmented, is producing medley with democratic processes, is producing discriminatory outcomes for people. And therefore, I would say that we need to realign this. And one of the aspects is very difficult to, 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 to put in the table and say, what do you mean by that? But, but having a human determination, I think, is super important. Because it means that it doesn't matter what happens in the black box. It doesn't matter that these uh, machines that are talking to machines. You, as human, are the one that needs to be deciding when the outcome comes, what is going to be the impact. I think we have that responsibility to make it work. Because what is happening is that the beautiful uh, outcomes that we can have with technologies are going to be pushed away because people are scared of being profiled or being uh, over surveillance or, or being used in, in very different ways. So I feel the conversation needs to change in terms of how do we talk about the human outcomes that we want to have with the technologies instead of focusing always on the technologies themselves. Thank you. Thank you for that, Gabrielle. I think that's an important thing also just to highlight and emphasize to always go back to is that impact. Uh, we do have time for one quick question before we invite all of the panelists to come. Meredith had earlier mentioned tools for self-assessments and algorithmic audits. And for, for the audience who might be interested, what are the best practices that currently exist in this field? So as a recovering compliance officer, maybe I can give you a quick insight into uh, how challenging this can be in an ML space. So um, first of all, Gabrielle, thank you so much, because transparency is just a beginning, because transparency when there's no choice is just informational, and there's no way for a person to change their experience until you give them actual choice. So I, I very much appreciate those distinctions. From a compliance perspective, um, governance models are a fantastic first foray. Uh, technical guidance doesn't exist for the ML space currently. It's one of the in intentions for some of the technical work that's happening in standards organizations like IEEE and ISO. And I think that it's very important for us to get to those success criteria that helps us understand how to technically apply some of the ethical principles that we, that we speak about very broadly in the space. Audit frameworks are fantastic, but also give you lots and lots of space to choose a, a strategy that works for your business. So as long as you've done your impact assessments, as long as you've done your risk assessments, there's not very much practical guidance on what is a pass or fail. <laughs> it's just how, what controls did you decide for yourself and did you meet those controls? So I think it's very important for us to get to some very standard baseline metrics and measurements um, that we can be very open and transparent about in order for people um, who choose to use public products and companies who choose to use algorithms uh, can use to, to make decisions about whether they want to incur those costs, those risks, and those benefits for their businesses. And I'd love to hear from others with how they think of metrics and measurements in a way that can be uh, baselined against a, a world standard. Well, Yuta, it's so interesting to hear uh, the perspective of a former compliance officer, uh, because compliance is really where the uh, where the action is, 
uh, in terms of making algorithms uh, compliant and accountable. Uh, so we absolutely need metrics and measures, and we need technical standards. We need all of these things. Uh, for people who are not immersed in that level of detail, however, uh, I would say that one of the places you can start is with a question that Kathy O'Neill asks. Uh, Kathy O'Neill is the author of Weapons of Math Destruction. She runs an algorithmic auditing company called Orca. And the question that she asks is, uh, for whom does this algorithm fail and when? You can also ask yourself why, okay? And so I also, uh, in addition to that excellent question of you know, for whom does this algorithm fail, I would add a question, a concept from Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology. Ruha Benjamin urges us to use the framework that technology discriminates by default. So if you assume that technology is, uh, is doing great and every AI is trustworthy, that is not such a great assumption, right? You change the frame entirely and you can see things differently when you go into it saying, okay, I know that technology discriminates. Uh, how can I look for the gender discrimination inside this particular technological system? How can I look for the racial discrimination inside this particular technological system? And once you assume that these problems are there, uh, then it's easier to find them and it's easier to identify where the technology is failing and where you're going to have your compliance problems, where you're going to have your risk, where you're going to have your illegal activity, uh, where you have your big social problems. Thank you, Meredith. I think we can end with that. I, that's a lot of food for thought. And uh, let's now invite all of the panelists to come join us. A wonderful gr group of women and such stimulating conversation. If we could just have everybody back on the screen for one final oral tweet, as you would like to call it. Hello, everyone. Okay, thank you so, so much for such an amazing conversation. The title of this event is Girl Trouble, Breaking Through the Bias in AI. And I have one more request from each of you. In the length of a tweet or less, uh, that is 140 characters, <laughs> what is the number one recommendation following this discussion that you would give uh, of something that needs to be done? or reinforce to make sure that women play a lead role in AI and that AI is harnessed to ensure and promote gender equality. I can call you off, I'll call you um, off of my list here. Uh, Yuta, since we are doing oral tweets, would you like to start? Sure, um, I'll tell you what was most influential for me. And it was that my parents, both of them, my father, who's an engineer, and my mother, who worked at home, encouraged me in the sciences from a very young age. I would suggest that everyone, we need to have more women in the baseline of, of entering so the sciences so that some can choose to be doctors and biologists and some still continue to choose computer science and maybe from there choose AI. But please always encourage women to enter these formerly nerdy sciences, because they're not so nerdy anymore. They're super cool. That was more than 140 characters. Sorry. I love it. Super cool. Indeed. Wanda, do you want to go next? Thank you, Natasha. Well, I have a message for women in all of our diversity, including indigenous women, those from racial or ethnic minorities with disabilities, with diverse gender identities. Get informed, get involved, and join us to ensure that AI works for us, not against us, and that it responds to our priorities. Remember Shirley Shism, who said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your folding chair. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for the panel. I love that, Wanda. Thank you. Meredith. 
My best advice for making, uh, making more equitable AI is eliminate techno chauvinism, eliminate racism, eliminate sexism, pay women more and promote women more. Thank you for having me here today. It was a great conversation. Short and sweet and straight to the point. Adriana. Thank you. Um, so bias is not only in the data, but across the entire AI development chain. So we really need to have women at the level of decision making at every step to ensure design, development and evaluation is fair. So that would be my tweet. And thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Adriana. Nanjira. Well, I've already tweeted mine. So reframe the problem if we're going to attack it uh, effectively. Um, and the tech pipeline problem is a myth. What we need are institutional reforms across the board. Thank you. Latifa. Um, I think that uh, we need to move now from recommendations. We need to, be to, to look for acts for uh, sandboxes and policies and policy labs that force uh, having uh, women in, 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 in the life cycle of any uh, AI system. Uh, we need to have laws. We need to ensure that the future leaving no one behind, especially women. Thank you. Anne? I will say that I think that women can embrace uh, AI because it's not only about tech, it's about different type of skills and uh, capabilities. And it's really important to be part of this and not to be outside. So you should dare and go. Thank you. Ashwini? Um, representation, sponsorship and a systemic, relentless approach to bringing women into AI. Don't settle for anything lesser and start them young. As someone who has a 10-year-old daughter at home, um, start them young is a big one of mine. Thank you. And Gabriella. Thank you so much. I was taking note of all these. I would say that uh, let's teach algorithms some classes on human rights. Let's teach the algorithms to respect uh, gender equality. And I guess that you do that by translating uh, the rule of law in line, that we have online, offline to the online world with all the very interesting proposals that we have around the table. And watch this space because the ethics of uh, AI recommendation of UNESCO is just pursuing that. Thank you, Gabriella. You know, this is sort of my favorite way to end a panel because everyone did my job for me of just summarizing all the amazing points. And for the audience, this is such a informative two and a half hours. But if you only really had two minutes, this last stretch was just so such a good, good way to, to summarize everything. We've talked about how complex this problem is, um, the, how everybody needs to be involved, private, public, nonprofit organizations must work together. We talked about the importance of mentorship, of visibility, of women needing to be on the table and in board leadership positions. And of course, the value of accountability, transparency, and responsible and ethical use of AI. And that as Meredith emphasized, AI is hard and mathematical and difficult, but we have to work at it. And honestly, hearing everybody, it's just so heartening. Um, the future is bright. The future is female. Thank you so, so much, everybody, for your time. Thank you to Gabriella and Kay for their inspiring opening, to all the panelists for your insights, solutions, and calls to action. Literally, this conversation was just a cheat sheet, a crash course to everything about AI and gender inequality. And thank you to, to UNESCO and the World Economic Forum for having all of us and for hosting this event. Uh, and let's just take all the recommendations from this panel as mentioned and we'll be in a good place. In closing, I'd like to highlight that UNESCO's recommendation and the ethics of AI, which will be considered for adoption by its 193 member states at its general conference, conference in November, 
of this year has diversity and inclusivity at its heart with gender equality and inclusion of the global south as main areas of action. And I invite all those participating here today on the other side of their screen to be part of the solution in implementing this recommendation once adopted so that the way our technologies are designed, developed, and deployed is as diverse and inclusive as the societies we aspire to create. And if you're interested in continuing this, continuing this conversation, I invite you to, to join us on Twitter Spaces. I uh, follow me on Twitter at Natasha G to find out more about when this conversation will take place. And it's been an honor to have spoken to everyone and to everybody who's watching us. Thank you for giving us your time and listening to all these amazing women speak. There is no better way to celebrate International Women's Day. Thank you, everybody. And thank you so much for all of your insights. Have a good day or good night or good morning, wherever you are. Thank, thank you, you, Natasha. Natasha. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.